plenty of us observe of that, of that, of that. Do we? Do we at all? So the mean. So the the media is about to be monopolized, and you know the role the media plays in any democracy. So whole lot is on our neck as citizens, as responsible citizens, to just keep rendering our opinion, just for us to have a nation of our dream. Thank you. Good day, uh, good evening, and uh, good afternoon from Nigeria. My name is Paul, and you are welcome to Opinion Sharers. Today we want to talk about the possibility for us to achieve a new Nigeria. And then, we'll, since we'll be able to rejoin us, um, we will be talking about the Revolution Now project as well. So I have a lot of, uh, a list of behind us. We ensure that we are able to provide up who otherwise would, uh, wouldn't be permitted on the conventional platform to ask questions from uh, a dignitary like Mr. Shore. And that is why we have these people here uh, this day. So I have, um, because if I ask everybody to introduce themselves, we might have, um, you know, a little bit of each. So I will just uh, read out the names of people that we have here. We have uh, Michael Sukomi. We have uh, Mr. David. We have Mr. Abdullahi. We have Aladio Komo. And then um, who else do we have? We are see, we are expecting at least about um, seven additional uh, seven guests, you know, at least. But let's hope they turn off, especially for those who, are, who might be joining us from Nigeria, since we know that uh, data is data can be a challenge. All right, but we'll be trusting that they will join us. And then we have Timile in there, up on my screen. Not only that, uh, even electric, because my battery is even currently full. So I don't think my battery will take me to the end of the conversation. That's, 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 that's what I was talking about. I know Salah, I can see you. And that's, I, that's what I've been saying. I've been trying to see how I can actually personally advocate for our Nigerians who who are struggling with internet. You know, I, I think uh, perhaps Nigerian internet is one of the most expensive in the world. And I think it's, it is an injustice in this uh, current world, in this uh, current dispensation that people don't have access to a st very strong internet. It is something that uh, I don't think we should, I, I don't think it should be happening. Right? So Mr. Moyele is here with us. Yes. Michael, are you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. So. Absolutely. Okay. Um, but please take a, a second to share this broadcast. Please Where can do you... share it on your group. Share it on your handle. Wherever. You're welcome, Mr. Shore. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm trying to get uh, 
to find out where to share it from. But I can't seem to find it, but that's fine. Okay, I... All right, um, can my... You can't seem to find it, okay, let me... I'm trying to find out where to share it, but if uh, I'm not logged in, maybe that's the reason. So. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's something that uh, maybe it has to do with logging in. Maybe it's a tool that, but I could quickly log in as well and just. Yes, yeah, please. If 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 you would, that would be very good. And then I can perhaps I send you the link. Uh, I can send you. All right. It was easy. It says log in and you get a call. Your watch, uh... okay. yeah. Yes, it is easy. It's very easy. So I think I'll I'm... send you a link now on the WhatsApp. I think. Just share. Okay. All right. Okay, now let me copy it. 168, 173. Welcome once again. Well, thank you Everyone, for especially Chogore. I had prepared, I had asked one of our team to read Dr. Chogore's program so that we don't, uh, there's no need asking for Mr. Chogore to tell us about himself. I, most, virtually every one of us here uh, is aware of who Mr. Chogore is, but just for the sake, for the benefit of those who may be watching us. I am even expecting that some non Nigerians will be watching us. So ask one of our team to, to read out how to meet that to rest, um, profile just briefly. Mark, can you please go ahead and do that? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, good evening from Nigeria. I'm talking from Ilori, North Central region of the country. Just uh, by way of introduction, we know that uh, Omoyele Sore is a company name as far as um, Nigeria's democracy is concerned. He was born in 6th of February, 1971, a Nigerian human rights activist, a pro-democracy campaigner, former presidential candidate of uh, AAC, and um, a founder of the online news agency called Sahara Reporter. Yele Soure is from SLDO, local government in Oshun State, uh, in Undo State, in southwest Nigeria. He was born in the Niger Delta region of the country, comprising of six states of the southwest region, where he was also raised in a polygamous home with 16 children. At 12, he learned to ride a motorcycle so that he could go to lake to go fishing for food for his entire family every morning before going to school. Uh, so we already studied geography and planning at University of Lagos. Uh, funny enough, there's one of your member, alumnus member here in this uh, assembly this evening. So perhaps you can hook up after the event. That's by the way. And um, his academic program was extended by two years after being expelled twice for political reasons. And, and, and student activism. He was the president of University of Lagos Student Union Government between 1992 and 1994, where he was involved in anti-courtism and anti-corruption uh, advocacy. So Ure holds a master's degree in public administration from Columbia University. And of course, he has been a voice in Nigeria's political space since his undergraduate days in the University of Lagos and of course, we know we are where he played a strong role in the military during the military junta in Nigeria. So he's a convener of the revolutionary movement, a movement that is spreading across the length and breadth of the country uh, like wildfire. So on this occasion, I welcome Mr. Mole Elis Ure to this platform. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. So, so. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Ms. Ashamore is let's hope that he will join us back. That's uh, that's what I was saying about Nigeria network. Okay. The way people are managing in Nigeria is even civil commendable, honestly. When you look at the fact that uh, uh, somewhere people can people can actually buy data for data about uh, 50, 50 gig 50 gig data for less than five dollars somewhere in the world, okay. And then in Nigeria, I don't know how much it is to buy to buy one gig. How you know in, in how Nigerian youths would want to survive without internet in this age? I personally don't understand it, and I think we we have to step for being able to you know manage or endure the this kind of Nigeria that we have. Because honestly, I think it's difficult. I think it will be difficult. Can you hear me now? Michael, how, how are you here? Brief is actually to properly connect. I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. Michael. Yeah, he's back on the platform. He's back on the platform. Can you hear me? Okay. He's back on the platform. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Shabore, I yes. and, and for, for our viewers, this platform has been created solely to give uh, up to people who have something to say, and youth especially, especially things that have to do with policy, politics, policy of government, and other, all other social issues. I want us to be able to, you know, lend our own voice. I want us to be able to say something regarding whatever it is that is happening in Nigeria, right? And so today we have um, uh, currently four additional uh, members who will be asking questions. We we are expecting more people, but I'm sure they must be having difficulty regarding to data or you know electricity. Mr. Abdullahi, I've been here earlier. He said his phone is low. Uh, even though he's in Abuja, I wonder that uh, there is no even electricity to, to charge mobile phone in Abuja. So, and if there's uh, people in Abuja struggling for electricity, I don't know how people in my village will manage it. So, anyway, these are some of the things that we'll be, we'll be discussing. Please put off your your mic, off your mic, if, if that if you can do that for us, please. Thank you. I think that will be you, Mr. Aladio. Come on, please off your mic. Okay, I'll go straight to my first question to Mr. Shore. Um, yeah. I am of Nigeria, and I am your fan. I want a better Nigeria. Severally, I've told myself, look, looking at what is happening, in Nigeria, I have told myself that uh, I am, you know, I am one of those people that are seceding mentally from Nigeria. But I tell you the truth is that I've not been able to do it. Each time I say, okay, I'm not even going to write anything about Nigeria. I will not say anything about Nigeria. Whether it's good, fine. If you know good, fine. But I've not been able to do it. I've been struggling yeah. with it. So I've come to the conclusion that I am perhaps one of those Nigerians who who cannot, uh, who cannot pretend, who cannot stand on the fence. And I know that there are so many Nigerians who are, who are standing on the fence as we speak, especially the people in the middle class. 
the people who can afford generator wow. to power themselves to give them to yeah. supply themselves electricity all right some of these people seem not to care about what is happening in nigeria so i want to ask mr shore are you with me sir i'm here yes i'm back there now can you hear me loud and clear okay okay yeah I hear you so I, I am already asking you a question and i'm saying that the uh, our middle class the, the, the middle class men and women who are comfortable relatively who can afford generator to power to supply themselves electricity in nigeria uh they can afford to you know maybe to change their attire as, as often as they need to because the roads are bad. They can afford private schools, private secondary, primary, and the university for their children. Most of them are standing on the fence. This is my own perception. All right? I'm saying that what are you doing as an individual as they convey, what are you doing to please reach out to those people? Thank you. Can you guys hear me loud and clear, please? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So, my answer might be different from what you expect. Uh, and my answer is that the question to me, to my mind, is what are we doing about people who want to fight? Which is a large number of disgruntled, aggrieved people in our polity who are willing to state it, who are in their large numbers disenfranchised, they have been disempowered, disemboweled by the system. They are all over the place. We haven't even harvested those ones yet. So why worry about people who are you know, complacent, people who are still standing in the middle? And because the reason why I'm reacting or answering this way is that the people who are standing in the middle, they are the most educated, they are the most aware of the situation in the country. But they decided for reasons best known to them, which is within their rights too, not to join in the battle for a better country. And we can go into the various reasons why they are not doing that. Some of them are completely fearful. Many of them are benefiting somehow from the system, even though they pretend not to. So many of them are hoping that they will become the next oppressors if they are not governors or senators or House of Rep members, they are hoping to become their special advisors, senior, junior, anything advisors. Some of them are hoping that they will become their mistresses or what do they call the ladies that uh, uh, offer themselves for cheap. Uh, to this and I'm not in any way denigrating any class. But there are class of Nigerians who are very, very upset with this whose consciousness has risen to the level of wanting to fight. But they need us. They need us to lead that sector. They need us to lead that class. We haven't been able to reach all of them completely. And until we are done with all these people, in my view, mobilizing them to the barricades, why worry about people who are too satisfied or too, are too complacent or too afraid to take it on? This is, this, what I'm sharing with you has been my experience last few uh, years, particularly since 2008, when I re-entered the fight for a new Nigeria uh, that, we, that we are still uh, battling with, or battling for now. So that, is, that, that would be my answer to this uh, very great question you asked uh, regarding what I've seen on the field. I'm sharing with you my battle experiences and uh, feedback on the field. We have a lot of people, young people who want to fight, who just need mobilization, who need guidance, who need a little bit of support here and there. When I mean support, they're not even looking for money. But sometimes they want to be sure that if they get into trouble, there are lawyers to help them, uh, you know, and some other support uh, uh, system that may be in place for fighters like them. And until it's when you get to these people that the ones who are sitting on uh, on the fence, as you claim, or as we now know them or they are called, 
will find no other alternative than to get up and uh, get up their uh, behind and move along with it is going to the critical mass. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question, maybe after my next question, um, I'd like uh, Timila to get ready to ask his question. Um, my next question would be, uh, when we go back to history of Nigeria, talking about the uh, amalgamation of the colony by the British. In fact, one day for this, I learned that the name Nigeria actually was um, something that was formulated by Lord Lugard's girlfriend, who later became his wife. All right? So there is so much about uh, Nigeria right now that I think it's even difficult to even call a country or a nation. Or, well, it is a country. It's a nation when you look at it. Uh, uh, and... Um, we are under the federal government and the status. But I'm talking about there is no unity the, between the South, the, the North. Even when you look at the South, a lot of people, even in, in Yoruba, uh, in, among the Yorubas, some people are saying, I am a Jesha, I am a Kiti. Other people are saying, I am Lagos. You know, and you see, even it extends even to the East. So I, I am now, uh, as a, a Nigerian, um, I'm not. I'm no longer a youth, okay. But uh, as a, a younger, I mean, a, a, an adult. Let me say, I'm an I'm an adult, okay. I'm thinking in my head that there may be need for us to find time to sit down as citizens of this that country and decide how do we want to live. And I, I'll give you a reason, uh, a few reasons why I am saying so. Recently, there have been, uh, uh, you know, a, a Sharia law that has given a judgment that a boy who, who sang uh, a singer has been, you know, convicted and declared, to, you know, he's supposed to be, ki to be killed, to be executed. Now, people like me feel offended by that. And the reason what? is that we live in the what? same country. What? I mean, we call it what? our country. So what? anywhere I go, uh, what? What? yeah. Let me, let me plead with you to let us compress the questions, you know, so that others can participate as we go along. What I mean is make your questions compact so that you just let's be a little succinct in the questions. Otherwise, it me too, I will forget the line of questioning because it's a little bit bulky. I just want to plead with you so that we can just make it direct, boom, 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 so that we can answer the questions as they are succinctly asked. So, and I want to cut you short on that one because you just mentioned something that, that you know, okay. that tickles my fancy about how we look at you. Know, first, there is unity, but when the unity we have is not the unity that is in your own interest. There's unity among the oppressors. When they are sharing money in Nigeria, looting the treasury, there is no Yoruba, there is no Hausa, there is no Christian, there is no animist, no Muslim. Bunch of thieves. They don't argue. They enter into the vault, share the money, and everybody walk away with as much loot as they can. It is that this is profitable for them, that they create this unity. I understand. They create this, you know, wait, I, let me just finish. Let me just, I don't, I don't want to lose my, my time. Paul, just, just let me just finish. Okay. But so they create, they create, yeah, they have I, I have even where I am going. I understand. You said something that I wanted to respond that, that, to. I don't want to lose track of it because you just mentioned also the Muslim guy who is being killed, who wants who is going okay. to be killed for blasphemy in Kano. Yeah. And probably you are justifying that to show how we are not united. Mm -hmm. But you also have forgotten that a pastor yeah. in Port who is not from Kano also said he wants to kill somebody for abusing his father, who is Oyedepo. So that's what I'm telling you. Within that class, there's unity. There's unity of stupidity, of bigotry, of greed, 
but they use other instruments to divide you and I, to make you feel like you're Yoruba, you're Hausa. What we need is the unity of the oppressed. But there's unity of the oppressed. They're united. There's no difference between Tinumbu and Buhari or Gambari or who is that guy that started Boko Haram in uh, uh, in uh, in Borno State? There's no there's no unity among the oppressors, you know. So and when you are doing the analysis, don't cherry pick. Don't say that there's a blasphemy candidate in uh, Kano, and you forget that that the freeze is also a candidate for blasphemy or extrajudicial killing because Pastor Ibiemi has already put him out to be clubbed to death by Christian fanatics. So, just as you have the Christian fanatic in Kano, there's also, there are also Christian fanatics in the South. And the Ibiemi signifies that, and he just brushed it out on the pulpit. So, without understanding this concept of where they are coming from, probably we will be confused about where we are going to, too. Is the reason why you see that I'm not one of the people agitating for dividing Nigeria because I have been around the problem for so long. I know where we are headed. You divide Nigeria, you have just divided the problem. You mentioned the fact that even in Yoruba land, you know, we have our own type of racism. You know, the people in uh, Abelkuta think that Ijebu is inferior to them. Ijebu think that the kitties are inferior to them. I mean, inferior to them. The Ekitis, they call the people in SL the Araudo. The people in uh, Lagos call the Ekitis Araoke. You know, all those kind of languages already embedded in our culture that seem to perpetrate this hierarchy of superiority. They are all in all tribes. But that's not even my concern. My concern is that after you break up Nigeria, every part of Nigeria will be broken up with their own oppressors, more ferocious, more insidious, more greedy, that they would do to you even worse what they are doing to you in the, in this uh, enlarged Nigeria now. So I'm sorry, I didn't intend to cut you short, so please, just to get me right. I just want us not to lose track of your line of questioning because when it, when it goes a little bit longer, even me at my age, uh, my memory is not that uh, sharp anymore. Okay, I, I understand you. And um, my, my destination was actually, uh, I was going to ask you, when you look at all these all these peculiarities in, in these countries, and I don't believe that they're complex, because I've lived in India, and I know that India is vast, the culture is vast, the people is over one billion people, okay? So I don't, I don't subscribe to the, those who think Nigeria is complex and all of those things. But what I'm saying is that there is probably the need for us to sit down and agree on the terms of our being together as a nation. And that's why, because I think it is the lack of it that's making you see Biafra say, we want to go. And some people are already gathering and saying we are uh, the old doer, that we want to go. You understand? So, and, and I'm talking about those of us who the oppressed. I'm not talking about Tinumbu and the, the, the big pastors and the big imams who are the same thing, all right? Because it works for them. But I'm talking about those of us whom Nigeria has never worked for. I'm telling you, as I'm now 40, but was because uh, one, one governor, when I was uh, retaking WAEC in the year 2000, paid for my WAEC. That is the only thing I think about uh, maybe 1,200. That is the only thing. Every other thing I have had to, had to pay, I have had to suffer and do it for myself. So I'm talking on behalf of those of us, the oppressed. Is it possible? For the oppressed to to get to find a, a forum where we can agree and discuss, if possible, let's forget about this. How many year, How many years more do people like uh, Buhari, uh, Ushibado, and uh, even uh, what do you call it, Tinumbu? How many How many years more do they have? But I'm talking about those of us who are under fifty. Or you know maybe a few other people who, who might also be to, to sit down we think so and if you agree with me how can somebody like like you facilitate such so that every uh, some people behind
Can you hear me? Hello, did you get my question? Yes, okay, I, I hear you now. Yes, I have your question. I did cut off for a So, exactly, when there is no way the system as presently composed can accommodate you in the conversation that needs to happen. There is no way the system at presently composed can sit down with you. The system was not designed to sit down with you. The system is designed to talk over your head and to impose itself and its ideals on you, whether you like it or not, by hook or crook. So what are you facing now? You are facing, you are faced with a system that does not make any provision for your kind of ideals, your ideas, and your ideologies, your philosophy. So what do we have left as an option? is to organize and create our own system that will allow the conversation you are asking for to happen. It's to force, to put to birth a new, a brand new system that allows your ideas, my ideas, our ideals, our genuine desires, and aspirations to be accommodated. And that is where the idea of revolution came from because you are not going to change the system by waiting to be invited to a meeting. Even if democratically today they decide that they want us to have a conference, whether it's national or regional, you and I can never make it to the conference. Do you know why, just to remind you or rejig your memory, just the legitimate participation in elections in 2008 and 2019, what did they do? They refused to allow me to participate in debates that I'm entitled to as a candidate who was the most popular third presidential candidate in that election. They did their polls, everything revealed that in some markets, I'm number one. In some markets, I'm number two. And yet, yet, I was not allowed to participate in a debate, just a debate, to espouse my ideas on national TV. Because I don't want the ideas to reach anybody. And it will surprise you. It wasn't just the government or INEC or NBC that did it. Some of the people that opposed my participation in the debate were young people like you and I, NGOs. CSOs who were represented on that platform, they said, no, Shore is too, it's out of control. If you go and ask him to debate now, he will, nobody can control what he will say. And then came back and said, what if, some of them suggested that, what if they asked me to send an agreement not to say certain things on national TV, will I agree? They, they convinced themselves, which is true, I agree with them, that I can never commit myself to any agreement that will not myself, I mean, speak freely uh, on national TV or national issues. And as a result, I was cut off from the presidential debate. I even went to court. The judges refused to hear my case. So there is no place for you on the table, no place for me, no place for Timila in David, Olua Tosin. There's no place for Michael. There's no place for Babatunde Alade Komo. So in Nigeria today, no place for bright people. No place for good people. No place for ideas, ideals. It's a place for just crooked politics, prevent, prevent, uh, politicking that uh, we have seen in Nigeria that destroyed the country. The only solution, in my view, and this is a view that is now shared by a lot of people, is a revolution, a revolutionary process that will make them listen to the critical mass that have been uh, subdued over these years. So that's, uh, that's what I think about that question and my answer to it. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Shore. Um, I'll go to Timila now. Please uh, feel free to share your, ask your question. Thank you for having me. And um, 
my question goes thus uh in the last um, election in 2019 i was i think i acted as a presiding officer in uh, in the local government in the jebu and then um, i had a lot of people hear their opinion about all the candidates and then um, most especially sore and many of them were like if this guy could have maybe considered going for maybe a legislative position it could have made more sense to them and maybe it could have put uh polls and all that and having this opportunity before me to ask him a direct question i would not be asking him such question right now and rather i will be asking a question that would um, that will make us understand how it processes information and how and how he would undo such a situation first i will ask had he ever considered such um opinion like let me go for a legislative position perhaps where perhaps a senatorial or or a house of assembly position that's first and secondly had it been he, he did that <laughs> does it think and mr shore do you think that you would have made any significant impact in the nigerian political space today i'm asking this question most especially because of people that want to come out maybe under the umbrella of your party or or they want to come out as mentees to you do you think such people would make any impact if they do not have the federal might they do not have the power that be above and they are just like the only wits amongst the town so do you think there could be a vivid or significant impact that they will make thank you um i will ask you a question before i answer the question did you consider the election free and fair as a presiding officer where you presided over the election did you see a free and fair election Of course, we know that elections no, in Nigeria, no, no, no. there has no, not no, been no, any that is question. free. That's and... not my question. <laughs> I'm not asking you to indict yourself. <laughs> it definitely but was not. It wasn't. That's the I'll answer your question. So, you see, it is part of what they do to us. That's what I started this conversation with. People that have been pummeled over 60 years by the system we are all fighting against it that we want to uh unleash our anger on and depose the first thing they do to you is your self-esteem and when they destroy your self-esteem even a phd holder will be told that why didn't you start as a dangote driver first if he wants to make it in life that is what the system does to you it reduces you to nobody people who are asking that they're asking a guy like me or you who had a first degree, second degree, traveled all over the world for 20 years, set up a business that is thriving, even though things are hard, you know, an entrepreneur. I can call myself one because I set up a business 14 years ago that became slightly successful. Uh, they, they're asking you that I should be a, legis a legislator under a president who, who cannot produce his first degree, who cannot explain what he wants to do to the people who cannot attend the presidential debates right who doesn't know his left from his right that is what the system does to the mentality of your press they receive them to nothing and the first person to tell you not to aspire to be great because the entire life they have been handed inferiority inferiority they have now started to live under a complex known as inferiority complex. They have been defeated as a person or people from inside and outside. And their self-esteem has been replaced with something different. And they are the first to tell you that why didn't Mr. go to the legislative house? Now we go to the legislative house. If I go there, what do you think will happen? You know yourself already. That I will be probably the only voice there who will be saying, and my colleagues will gang up and remove me from the legislative house, 
and they will ask you to go to court. And by the time the courts are done with the case, your tenure is over. I can tell you how many people I have reported on as a reporter who were dead the same blow for being different, including the idiot Dino Melai when he first went to the House of Rep. His house was, his clothes were torn into pieces. He was beaten and ruffled up with uh, uh, another lady and a bunch of them in those days. Under uh, Saraki's 8th uh, Senate, there was one uh, Boko Haram senator that was removed from a house because he opposed them openly. He was one who was who raised the issue about Dino certificate. He was expelled from the Senate by Saraki and the rest. Under the last uh, assembly, well, there's one guy from Kano, I don't remember his name now, who was opposing them. They removed him. They, in broad daylight, they didn't give him fair hearing. But I'm not defending it. The reason I didn't ask to go to the house is not because I, I'm afraid of being removed. It's because I never aspired to be a lawmaker. I've always that if I'm going to aspire to a position in this country, it will be to preside over the country so that my ideas, as bright and as powerful and as punchy as they are, can see light, not to be covered up with emotion in one radical end of uh, a building in Abu National Assembly. I've never aspired to be a lawmaker. Never. And I've never regretted and never in any way thought that the best place for me to do to go is the National Assembly or the local government. If anybody feels that that is all they aspire for, we are 200 million people in Nigeria. Let them go to where they aspire to go to. Maybe some people are aspiring to be class captain. That's not their problem. You have to respect the limits of their aspirations. That is the bandwidth of their about leadership. Maybe some of them clearly and in all honesty don't feel like they can perform anywhere else better and above the people they see in the House of the National Assembly or State House of Assembly or chairman of the local government. That is their right. What I'm trying to tell you is that the fact that somebody wants to become the natural progression to the position of president is not local government chairman followed by house of the rep, followed by chairman of the local government, followed by governor, followed by senator. If that was the case, Donald Trump could not have become the president of the US because he was never a local government chairman. He was never a senator. Never a member of Congress. In fact, he didn't know that he had any political office before he contested for presidency. The same thing with Obama. Obama was just a senator for, he was a State House of Assembly member in Chicago, I mean, in Illinois. And then suddenly, I mean, after that, he was, for a few months, I would say, was a senator before he became president. So if you, if you look at the job description for president of any country, there's nowhere there where it said you must have this year number of experiences or that you must have been senator or local government chairman or class captain or SUG president. No. So, but that's my aspiration. And I've always maintained this. But most importantly, we keep insulting ourselves with this question. When you tell a guy who is 50 years old, I'm going to be 50 next year, that I need to go and become local government chairman first to govern Nigeria that has 200 million. When Obama and Bill Clinton, even uh, Kennedy, J.F. Kennedy, became president of the US with 350 million people, an economy that is in trillions, when they were below the age of uh, 45, 46, 47. So what, why are we doing this to ourselves? Why are we insulting ourselves with this repetition of Inferior, inferiority complex. When they say that to me, I always ask, if you were in the senator, who is going to be your president? You can never answer it, the question. Mm. Never. Okay, thank you, Mr. Shore. Thank you very much. I, I love uh, your, your response to that. Uh, Timla, you want to say something else? Oh, yeah. So, like I, like I 
said in the question, like it is not a direct question to him. So I was trying to ask this question um, about especially people that rose up um, under AAC in 2019. And I know that many of them, especially a friend of mine in Poland, he, I think he, were, um, uh, he ran in the Jebu local government. I, I've forgotten exactly where in the Jebu local government, in the Jebu. So he wanted to go for House of Assembly. So I was wondering if there was no AAC uh, governor, or uh, there was no AAC president eventually in 2019, how would an AAC House of Representative member or House of Assembly member cope in the state and um, national assemblies respectively? The question is a very good question, but it also and it was answered by an initial question, which is that does Nigeria permit people with a different mindset to coexist with people with whom they have ideological disagreement or position. No. So if you present an AAC candidate, I know the person you are talking about, you're probably talking about Kunle, who had always been my friend in this state before he left for Poland. You see. It would have been a fantastic idea to have an AST, uh State House of Assembly or member of the House of Rep be able to espouse their own ideas on this platform. But because we no longer practice democracy in the real sense of democracy, nobody stands a chance. In fact, nobody stands a chance winning an election where you presided uh, over the election because the major parties have already put thugs there, the police is conniving, everybody is working together in against the interests of democracy, free and fair election. So if our president had won, we would have stood by him. But the question, like I said, is would he have survived one day over there with the kind of political intolerance that we have, the domination of uh, politics that we have, and the fact that if our guy is not careful, he will be bought over if he's not sound and committed and focused. He will be bought over within a short time. There have been cases where these little small parties win elections and then they go to the State House of Rep uh, or State House of Assembly in particular. Within two weeks, they have been bought over. They renounce their party. They join one of the major political parties. But that was not going to be the case of AAC particularly referring to this, your friend, and who is, well, he's a mutual friend of ours, because I know him very well. He wouldn't have done that. But the question is, he couldn't have won the election that you presided over, even if he was the best candidate. So he's not, he stood no chance of winning that election, because they had been rigged against him from his election. Even as the presiding officer, if you were going to put top on him with Jebu where you were, he would have disappeared. Or never to be heard from again. Because that's the kind of politics that these guys have uh, brought upon our nation, Nigeria. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Shore. And um, where is Tunde? Okay. Tunde, are you there? Seems like someone dropped off. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think. Um, can you? I'm not sure if Tunde is there. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I can hear you. All right. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Yes. I hope you can hear me. Loud and clear. I can hear you loud and clear. Uh, uh, Mr. Shura, I will. Let me first start that. Yeah, let me first start by saying that uh, I'm deeply impressed that you are making such a great stride to cause a kind of uh, a change from the narrative of Nigeria. And secondly, let me say that I'm also deeply humbled to share the same alma mater with you, which is the University of Lagos. Um, 
Having said that, if we look at the status quo uh, of things in Nigeria, we we'll discover that it will be a little bit, or I say a little bit, it will be very difficult for anybody to, uh, any good man, let me put it that way, any good man to have win any uh, elective position and be able to push things around within the system. Why do I say this is that it, when you look at the National Assembly, let's say we have two Sena people in the National Assembly out of about 360 House of Rep members. 109 senators. It, it will not work. So now, I haven't understand that the present system that we are running in Nigeria is not sustainable. It will not work for the future of this country. And the revolution now thing, ever since I've heard of that revolution now, the main question in my mind that I want to pose to you now is that what is the main content, what is the specifics of this revolution since the one we have at hand cannot work and if anybody decides to vie for an elective position there's every possibility that the instrumentality the instrumentalism of government and other apparatus within the the, the state pass will not allow such individuals to win as against whatever they may be preaching so i want to know and i want us i want you to tell nigerians what is the content of that revolution that we can benefit from on the long run Uh, before we start thinking about the benefits, let's think about the sacrifice that needs to be made for for this to happen. The revolution is uh, for me, and as I want people to understand it, is to press the reset button for the operating system of Nigeria. The operating system as it is now has run out of memory, uh, RAM space, and uh, it's no longer working for anybody. I'm using the computer device uh, analogy to describe this to you. And we need to press a reset so that we can install new application on the democratic system that meets the tenets uh, of uh, real democracy in every sense and ramification of it. And uh, a, a revolution will do that job. And revolution is uh, an internal or external revolt uh, that says to people, enough is enough and we are no longer satisfied and able to cope with the current system that is stifling uh, and suffocating, asphyxiating our people, asphyxiating our aspirations and uh, our democracy. The yesterday, I've had to answer this question several and the first thing I say to people when they ask, what is the revolution? Is that I say to them, you know the meaning of a revolution. Just tell me that you are worried about engaging in a revolution. There's nobody who doesn't know the meaning of a revolution. Because if you don't know it, you knew what they did in, in Mali recently. People came out in their millions. And their president had two more years to go. But they said to them, it's like a contract. We had a contract with you for four years to provide us water, you know, food, take care of our foreign policy, national security. And you are not able to do it. We want to have the contract. We are tired. We don't want to continue with you anymore. You are the captain of the ship. The ship is not moving anywhere. We want to change the captain, or we want to change the ship itself. We want to. We are tired of passing the ship, always leaking, and it's about to sink. We want to move on to other ship, or we want to dock this ship, repair it completely, overhaul it before we start sailing again. That's what the revolution is about. Most of you know the meaning. It's very easy. Google helps you. But the reason why people keep asking, what kind of revolution do you want? What kind of revolution do you want? It's because people are, you know, expectedly apprehensive about the sacrifices that are needed. You know, would it lead to somebody going to jail? Could it get somebody killed? Would it be bloody? Would it be peaceful? So in between, they are trying to find the comfort zone uh, where, from where they can operate. I wish I can tell you that, yes, this is a revolution is going to be completely a certain way that fits and suits your comfort. But there's nothing that would encompass the level of change that we want now that will be totally comfortable for everybody. No, I will, I will be the first to admit that. We will have to work and overwork ourselves 
to lift the burden off of our uh, uh, shoulders and chest uh, that has been imposed on us for 60 years. So the revolution is the one that terminates this burden that has made it impossible for young people like you to get a job when you get out of school, made it impossible for you to get great education, to be able to, without knowing anybody, get an admission, uh, going to hospital that can treat you, you know, have your children, grow up in safe, sound, and uh, physically good environment, you know, the ones that allow you to travel on roads and see development that you desire actually happen in your country, in your lifetime. And when you can't do that, at least do that for your kids and generations uh, yet unborn. And uh, when I first met Paul Padumo, he told me this very interesting story of how well he has traveled. And everywhere he's traveled, I think now he's in the Middle East. He's, uh, he didn't say he's surprised, but my impression is that he's surprised at how easy things that are difficult to get done here get done by, all this, by people in other places, you know. How you wake up and uh, you see a sign that says, oh, there's going to be a 100 kilometers highway. It's going to be completed in two years. And you get to one year, it's complete. You know, they even project beyond their abilities. And so there's going to be a train line uh, from here to Badagri. And it's going to take four years. And in two and a half years, it's completed. In Nigeria, if they tell you two and a half years, it's going to be 20 years before it's completed. I telling you, I have been watching Lagos to Battle Expressway for more than 20 years. That They are not even constructing a new one. Just to, just to fix it. Just to fix it. They will fix it up to a place. It will look nice. And then they will leave it. Then they will go and fix the other place two years later. By that time, the place they fix is, is uh, destroyed. So that's the kind of country we are. We, we are in a shambolic state. Sometimes I find it difficult to keep telling people that we don't even need to explain to ourselves why we need a revolution. We don't need, we don't need long uh, Turinshi, as uh, house our people call it, long grammar. We know what to do. We know what's wrong with us. Probably we are afraid of what, you know, we are afraid of doing what we should be doing to put an end to it. And the longer we are afraid of it, the longer we stay like this, the, the worse the situation gets. Uh, uh, all right, let me, I, I appreciate that uh, response because you, you said that we have, we first talk about the, the sacrifice we all have to make. And I, that is what I keep telling people on a daily basis that if we want a change in new Nigeria, then there's a sacrifice for all of us to be made. Let, let me quickly ask just one more question so that other uh, panelists can as well be able to ask you a question. Uh, the 2013 or 2012 CONFAB, the National Conference under President uh, Goodluck Jonathan, uh, right. I want to ask if the report of that CONFAB is implemented, will it be a better place to start or there will still be a need for a higher degree of revolution? Oh, that, uh, that, uh, Confab was not designed to solve any problem. It was designed like every other confab. Every confab that the Nigerian government puts in place, or precedents, we've had many of them. I think under Abata there was a confab. I'm not sure if there was a confab under Abasanjo. I think there was. Yeah, there was some confab. I think it was led by Nikotobio. Not a Puta Pane. Towards the end of Abasanjo's tenure, when he wanted to extend his tenure part time, he had a confab too. So when Jonathan came, he set up his own confab too. Jonathan's own confab was meant to aid his uh, second term election. So you have to differentiate between the basis for this confab uh, and what they are there to achieve. But most importantly, it's representation. In the Jonathan confab and Obasanjo's confab, if I remember correctly, he handpicked most of the representatives to the confab. So it wasn't the people's confab. So you cannot use the outputs of such confab to determine the future of Nigeria. Like I keep saying, the world is expanding exponentially and dynamically today. You can't use 
what you used four years ago to cope with today. Look, look at technology, you know, and I keep going back to devices that we use, you know. But next week or next month or next year maximum, iPhone will come up with another phone device that we have better capacities. You know, when I came out of, before I went into detention, which was five months, which was uh, 20, it was 20, 20, 2019, right? I had a phone that had uh, two cameras, two cameras. That's the phone I'm holding on to you now. And I thought there would be no phone with two cameras until the next year. I came out and somebody was trying to take a picture of me when I came out of detention. I already had an iPhone that had three cameras. I think now they are phones with four cameras, right? <laughs> Why am I using this to tell you? We can't even use the decision taken four years ago to guide the future of a country in a world that is dynamically evolving every day. So if we are going to have a new, if we are going to move Nigeria forward, we cannot use decision taken by Jonathan's people to move Nigeria forward in 2020. We have to create completely brand new grand level uh, level playing field for new representatives, youth of different sectors of society, labor, and people who are tech savvy, because technology must also play a role in how we are looking at the future. Sustainability must play a role. People who went to his conference didn't know about cars that are using, uh, that are not using petrol. You know, now we are talking about solar energy, in flying planes, and you are still talking about Jonathan's uh, uh, consumer conference that <laughs> took place six, seven years ago. So they can't fit into the evolution and the, dynam the dynamism of the world now. We need brand new coming together if they let it happen and proper representation of all the nuances uh, and a different kind of ambience. Uh, it's completely different from what you saw in Jonathan's uh, consumer conference. Because it was those consumer, it was uh, Jonathan's consumer conference. If you look at all the people in front that day, uh, I don't know if you've seen the picture, most of them were asleep throughout, the, they slept through the conference, all those traditional rulers, old people. Some of them even died in Abuja while the conference was ongoing because they were not a person, a bunch of sick people. I'm not saying that we hold it, but I'm just saying that. I'm just giving you some of the uh, uh, things that I observed during that period and why I feel like it's not a starting point for us. Again, we have to press the reset button and, and start all over again. So. Mr. Moyeli, okay. thank you so much. Yes. I I if, I, if you guys don't mind, um, in, in getting involved in this, I thought we could get things done in about an hour. And I have, you know, events lined up for, I told you this. Some of, them, some of them I prepare for, some I don't prepare for. But there's a lot uh, going on in my life every day here, as you know. So if we can be thinking about wrapping up, please, with due respect. Okay. Yeah, we, we give um, the people that are here to ask you questions uh, a few of us and we'll make it quickly. Okay, Mr. David, you're next. Oh. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, all right. Um, good afternoon, sir. Uh, thanks to everybody on this platform and I appreciate our guest speaker, Mr. Omoyedeso, all right? So thank you very much for everything and for all you're doing. And I have um, the questions. Uh, what can we do for all about those that are in the corridor of power? These people who are not elected, but because of what they are gaining from these politicians, so they lobby themselves into the corridor of power. And it's difficult for an ordinary citizen to ask smart them or to do something reasonable in the sight of the nation because of these people. So what can we do to get rid of them so that ordinary man can speak? 
because these are the people that defend this politician we're talking about. Even this politician, they are not on Facebook. Some of them are not on Twitter. But they are, they are people they are right there defending them. So what can we do to get rid of them? They are in the state, they are in the local government, they are everywhere. So secondly, um, this revolution is a thing that I really, I'm, I'm really into it. But um, what can we do to gather another set of agitation? Like this Odidua Biafran, for instance, Odidua Biafran revolution now. And this October 4th that is coming ahead of us, what can we do to make sure that people don't see only Omoyele so worry? That is not what it's meant for, but that is how some people now saying, oh, that is your things. No matter how we explain to them, they don't want to understand. So what can we do and who are we talking to so that we can gather the momentum we need and to preach this message to people so that they will not see it as South versus North or uh, the Igbo, Yoruba, they're against the North. So what are we doing every day to, to make this clear to people? So um, I don't know if you can talk on that. No, uh, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, one of the things that uh, has to happen is constant political education, constant conscientization, and it happens through mobilization. And mobilization is not something that is, you know, perpetual. You have to test your soldiers from time to time. When I use the word soldiers, I'm using them advisedly, all these mm -hmm. uh, agitators from time to time in protest. For instance, I'll give you an example. When we started revolution now in 2019, before we could even start, I had been arrested. Mm -hmm. So what made a difference was that I was arrested, but it still went ahead, but it was limited. In 2020, August 5, one year after, I was still wearing my trousers, right? When I heard that 15 cities had risen and started fighting the government, it became headline in the Even the press did not expect it. And if you look at even currently what we are doing, we did an online protest the other day on Zoom. It's never happened before in Nigeria that people protested. But it was our own digital response to mobilizing people who could not physically participate. And at the point, it was close to 500 people in attendance. When it was uploaded to Facebook, Consular Reporters, a day after, it had reached 458,000 people. Exactly. Tells you that level of People are still watching them to tomorrow, even on YouTube and our Facebook page on Sahara Reporters. So we have to keep mobilizing people. The number of people that believe in revolution in 2019 have increased geometrically in 2020. Because in 2019, their response was to go to Google to find out the meaning of revolution. In one day, over 5 million people search the word revolution on Google. You can mm -hmm. go and find out. You're right. Because of what happened in 2019. In 2020, they are no longer searching. They are trying to participate. So online that day, people were asking us, where can I join? Where can I join? And if you were on, we were, because we were trending on August 5, a lot of people were disappointed. So why didn't you have the Kutakot uh, revolution as I could join? And Kano and Kaduna, places that we didn't, we couldn't get to in terms of organizations so we have enough people were willing to join. Now we have all those cities and states and towns and villages in the basket because why we did not stop mobilizing, you know, instead of agonizing. So you have to keep educating people. You have to keep talking to them. And that's why sometimes, even though I have my concerns about religion, I learn something from them, you know, particularly the people they call Jehovah Witness. If they come to your house this Saturday, you drive them away. You will not stop them from mm -hmm. next week. Without they are awake, 
Yeah. If you ask them, why, what are you still looking for? The moment you open the door small, they will put a leg in it and start speaking to you. By then they come the third time, you will let them in now, and then you become friends with them because of persistence. We have to sustain the temple. We have to be persistent with explaining to people because you see a lot of people want to see Nigeria change, but not many people want to leave their comfort zones or make the sacrifice because what we know is that any time you go out to protest, police will shoot at you, and honestly, nobody would, would like to die. Nigeria is bad enough. People are just hoping they can survive and survive, and one day they can get out. Or mentally see that uh, I usually use and Paul repeated today from the place so that you can have your own cocoon where you live and nothing touches you. So that's, that's, that's the way it is. We have to keep working. But I think that if uh, August 1st, becomes really successful, the mobilization you are doing will become also equally successful. Because then you discover that on August 2nd, people will ask you to continue. And that's how we started in Mali. It's how we started in Sudan. In fact, we started in Sudan with some female doctors. They were gathering in corners in Sudan and saying they want revolution. They make fun of them. They were making fun of them. Some of the people we see them, they will drive past them and say, go and marry. It's because you don't have husband. Mm -hmm. That's why you have time to be protesting. One day, what started with 10 people became 100. It became 1,000. And one day, it became a million. And a leader of Sudan that had been in power for how many years ended up in prison as we speak. The leader of Mali, who had 10 more years to spend in office, has ended up first in prison, and now he's in hospital. He just had a major stroke that he's not likely to survive. But had the people not pushed, had people just kept using excuses to buy time, it would not have happened. So you have to make the push. You have to make the sacrifices. And it's the reason I brought my, when I came out of detention, I came out and said to people, look, it left to them alone, I'm telling you this, they were hoping that I'll run away. I just arrange with somebody to take me to Kutono and I will find a way out. Maybe I'll be hanging in Ghana and find my way to America to my family. So that when other young people come out in the future, they say, Look at you now. So we don't run away now. He said, We go run after some time. Maybe just a look at. I told them, I'm not going to run away. This is my country. It's the reason I didn't think my citizenship. I'm a Nigerian. 20 years in America, I never went to where they are applying for citizenship. Because it's not that I I love Nigeria more than other people. It's just that I cannot withstand what the people are doing to this country. And I don't feel like it's the right thing for everybody to run away from Nigeria for them. And I've had a share of my I've had a share of my running away. You know, I spent 20 years in America. You know, mostly in and around New York City, the biggest city, one of the biggest cities in the world. So there's nothing else out there that I forgot that I need to. There's nothing I need to show to the world. I've traveled widely. I've had kids. I've been married. You know, I've done what 10% of our brain can do very well. I've gone to school. I've you know acquired two degrees. What else? So as they say in Nigeria, we die here together. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that um, comment and answer. And um, I hope that every one of us will keep doing what we know how to do best. Um, I know one day uh, we will attend the victory we are looking for. Revolution now. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Shivore. I quickly go to ask you some question. Uh, we still have about 10 minutes to the Minister Shore uh, expresses to you. So please quickly. I continue with my question. Can you hear me? Who's I next? I can hear you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Shore, and thank you for your time here. Thank you. I, before I will ask my question, I want to get a clarification. A, uh, now, can I consider you now an activist or a politician? 
I say the use of the word politician has connotations in our own culture. When they call somebody a politician, they are stylishly saying that you are a liar, you are a thief, and a dishonest person. That's the connotation here. You know, because okay. if you owe somebody money and he doesn't pick your call, when you when he picks your call, say, ah, why are you playing politics with me now? <laughs> because automatically <laughs> you regard that person as someone who is playing game. A liar. No. Yes. I've, I've been an activist all my life. There's no reason okay. for me to act politician to it. You don't have to be a politician to to get involved in electoral politics or partisan politics, as they call it. You don't have to be a politician. Uh, you just have to be a citizen of the country. Yeah. And I'm answering this question to advise on the meaning of politician in Nigeria's context. Or to respond uh, to um, I'm asking that question so I will know if what we are going through, I'm, we now, I mean uh, your followers, people that believe in your struggle, that believe in your ideas and are buying to it day by day. I, so what are we, are we going with now? Are we going with revolution now or we are looking at still running for office? We are running for freedom because you cannot run for office without it was like asking that you want to drive over a lake and you have no bridge built over it you are going to end up at the bottom of that lake no matter how great you are as a driver except you are driving an amphibious car and there are not so many of them that i know about what is the bridge that will lead us to running for election and winning election a disruption of the current you know corrupt incompetent dishonest and wicked political process that keeps good people away from becoming leaders that they deserve to be and what is deserving of the leader is for you instead of walking around with wads of cash to have you be able to espouse your ideas and win election and help your people. But people who win elections in Nigeria are people who only have words of cash but without ideas. I think there's a Kenyan professor who said it, his name is uh, Pierre Lo Lumumba, who said uh, people with ideas don't win election and people without, yes, I, I, there's a way he put it. I don't remember uh, precisely the way he said it now. So. That is where we are going. But this movement that we have built is a bridge to that opportunity that you are talking about. So that you will not come back in 2023 and say that, oh, we should have done what we needed to do to change the system before we start running for office. Like every other person, I could go and hide too. And when it's two weeks to election in 2023, go and print posters and start disturbing you again. And Timulei, who will not be a presiding officer then, but knowing how the electoral process works, will say, why is Shawara so stupid? He should have known that he can win this election because the electoral process doesn't allow for people like him. But if the process as it is, this oppressive system is demolished, is deposed, we can, we can negotiate what happens next. It will be on our own terms. We can just, you might even be running against me in 2020 because you'll be so confident in the transparency of the electoral process that you say, so whereas ideas are too old, and he's too old anyway, he's 52 years old in 2020. Me, I'm still younger than him. I'm going to run against you. And you'll be completely all right. Nobody would then tell you that you should go and start from local government because your ideas will be quality enough to be president. You know, who was the guy who first introduced us? The guy with the radio voice. You know, I was <laughs> listening to him, and his voice, honestly, was flawless. And I'm looking at, you know, probably there are millions of guys like this. His introduction, I was like, very, it was sweet in my ears, you know. Even though I hate to be introduced, I didn't want him to stop because of the way he was presenting it. And it was just flowing. It was like poetry. Nigeria has people like him. 
And then you go and appoint Buhari or select Buhari to election. And then you are wondering why your country is like that. Can I, uh, I get that now. Now, uh, in form of advice now or to contribute to that, can I advise that you make your presence to be, uh, to be known not only on uh, social media, but right now you are in Abuja, you can make good use of that by appearing. Uh, I know you are not a religious person that much, but uh, if we want to get some people, if, because for revolution and for election, is we need numbers. And these numbers are in the market, they are in churches, they are in mosques, they are in, uh, in gatherings. So I want to employ, now that you are in Abuja, you're on ground, you should make your present to be more known and offline. I, uh, I completely agree with you. And we've been doing that. Last uh, two weeks, I, I, had, um, I went to a group of pastors to talk about politics. And the argument that is not naturally degenerated into religion. And they were asking me my religious purpose in life. And uh, by the time I finished the Christian, uh, defending myself, they told me that I was better than so many of their pastors. So I, I can easily uh, compete with any pastor on the pulpit. I trust, trust me on that one. Uh, but I agree with you, we should do more. But don't forget that I'm also under a bunch of legal restrictions, even in Abuja, uh, that we don't need to repeat here or recast here. But I agree with you, and uh, but we've been reaching out a lot, and we hope all of you are doing the same wherever you might find yourself. Let's just all be who we can be. You don't have to be another chivalry, but you can be yourself. You can just build upon the little I'm able to do, and uh, we can do better. There's no time that people make the suggestions that I am opposed to them. We can always be better than what we're doing. We can be bigger than even some churches uh, when we get there, but we can even get bigger faster when we win some victories uh, in the next few weeks or days. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Shavare. Uh, I would like to, I would like to read this uh, statement. It's, it's. Uh, I, I saw somebody. In fact, Michael, whom you said you, you love his voice, uh, he call, called my attention to it earlier today. He was. Uh, one of the media persons of Buhari that posted it on Facebook. And um, I read it quickly. You probably may have seen it anyway. He said, I have, I have to charge all of you to defend the government vigorously and to allow, to allow irresponsible and politically uh, motivated activists to keep spreading patient, uh, to keep spreading patent falsehoods about this government, information to the public and should be better packaged. Go on the offensive. We are proud of our achievement and we should blow our trumpets. That's uh, President Muhammad Buhari uh, 8, that's yesterday. So I want to say, Mr. Shore, uh, is it possible, because Mr. Uh, Mr. President is asking his ministers and cabinet to on offensive, right? On the or against the people he termed as a uh, political activist, right? So, uh, and I'm now putting it to you. Uh, are you scared? And do you think people who believe in revolution now, or people who are in one way or the other, are acting, even if acting as opposition or protesting against this government, do you think they should be scared? Because you know. uh, yes. Thank you, Paul. How many of you know Sonia Ade very well? Most of you guys, right? There was a song uh, he sang, uh, I don't know which year, he said, Emi nomba wi nya wo olorun ni, cho wa ma wo won ni Of course, they are talking about me <laughs> in saying this. So, but let me, let's just dissected this way. The fact that after a year and a half, after about six years in office, 
they still can't figure out the achievement to the point that they have to be advising themselves inside the chambers of uh, Aso Rock, uh, the council chambers, to go aggressive on people. It tells you their level of confusion. They are confused. These guys are completely confused. They are overwhelmed. They're just putting up what they call boat face. You know, they just like try to make it sound like, you know, they are in charge. Um, you know, anybody who used to be an activist or who is mistakenly thought to be an activist, a person of conscience, who loses direction to the point that people like Kayamo are now, the way I address them is to address them as Prestos Kayamo of blessed memory, you know. They have transited into another world. And that would be my answer. There's nothing to it. Let's just keep doing what we are doing. This is to show to you that what we are doing is effective. Because our number we are. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Shore. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, I have uh, a list of questions here that I probably would love to ask. You know, I have to run. I have uh, people waiting for uh, me for uh, my uh, next meeting. It's been... it's been an hour and uh, oh. a half, more than that. Right. Almost. I, I have to run any moment from now, please. I, I will, you know, we can do this again as frequently as we want. Yeah. You know, you and I are close. And you have made me more friends now. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sobre. All right. keep, keep doing what you do. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate right, your comments today. Thank you so much. Great questions, and uh, hope to see you again. Aluta Continua, Victoria Sata. Victoria Sata. Sata. Yes. No. Thank you. Um, viewers, we thank you. We want to appreciate you for coming to participate in this discussion. Uh, we seriously enjoyed Mr. Shore. I hope uh, he will join us. I mean, he has promised even that he will be joining us soon. We can always reach him, and we are expecting that uh, any other person who will be interested in uh, this kind of communication, please reach out to us, and uh, uh, we will uh, we will keep having this discussion because I think it uh, it is compulsory. Uh -huh. All right. So I yes. was still going to ask uh, uh, Michael earlier, but Michael is no more here. So ask uh, before we go. I'm to have uh, uh, David and uh, Aladi will come on from Nigeria. All right. I want to ask you people: How do you deal with internet and uh, connection? How do you manage? Um. Today you can quickly. Hi, you know. Uh... Uh, uh, all right. The the issue of uh, network uh, efficiency and, of course, the pricing of data in Nigeria is so absurd, if I have to say that. And why I say that is that uh, there are times that you, you buy data as expensive as it may be, and you will not even get a value for what you are paid for. Uh, in a circumstance where you, you get maybe one gig at the rate, one, one gigabyte at the rate of 500 Naira, and some part of it, there are some conditions attached to it, that you have to use some part of it in the night, uh, some part of it in the day, and there, there are times that uh, time bound that is attached to, to this uh, data that you have purchased with your money. And at any time, at any time at will, these network providers can decide to take away this uh, the service so it is crazy and absurd uh, absurd if i may say uh, the issue of data management it, it boils down to not only the internet facility alone even the data management itself that we have once talked about on this platform we we have a very less value of data management data acquisition data quality in this part of the world and it's just a, a shame on about over 200 million nigerians Mr. David, you want to quickly say something about that? Uh, yeah, uh, I, actually, I'm not. Um, uh, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that question. Yeah. I, actually, now I'm not calling from Nigeria, so 
I'm in Florida right now, but um, uh, but basically, <laughs> with what is happening in Nigeria, everybody is aware of it. So you don't get value for what you pay for. As I'm talking to you right now, I'm expecting another provider to switch my internet. It's not that the one I'm having is not good, it's serving me, everything is okay. I connect all my TV and all the room, all the gadgets. But I can switch anytime I like if anything I find is not convertible, maybe price or anything. So here, data is not an issue. So you get what you paid for. Even at times, if you convert it, we pay less here compared to those that are paying in Nigeria. For instance, here you can pay maybe $45 or $50 for a month and you use it as much as you want. You stream live, you do everything. Even on the go on the street, you still connect with your wiver. But it's not <laughs> the same thing in Nigeria. I remember when I traveled to Nigeria 2014, so I subscribe normally. I didn't know that when you are not using it, you turn it off. I left my phone on. Mm. So after my data finished, they switch to my <laughs> to my <laughs> normal normal charging. They started every of my cash in the phone. Mm. My I mean my calling credit. Everything within one hour, more than five thousand or seven thousand, was disappeared. I don't know. So <laughs> I think it's something we have to deal with in that country. Uh, we have to work on that. Um, I think so that people come have access to much data and watch this program. Because many people now, as we're watching, how many people can use their data normally, if not for occasionally, to watch program of one hour, one hour, 30 minutes. So I think it's a thing we have to look at. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. David. I was actually, pardon me, I thought maybe your number, I thought maybe when I saved your number yesterday, because there were a lot oh, of yeah, uh, people that were supposed to have done from, oh. But my concern was, how are they going to manage uh, to, to stream live, uh, to attend a stream, a stream live event for one hour? So, exactly. because I just keep uh, feeling for them. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, Thank you, thank you, guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking that uh, for those who are business minded, who might be watching this, please let us find a solution to this. Because I don't think Nigeria, I've, this is one of the things that we saw uh, uh, provide solutions to. As much as we want to solve the problem of uh, electricity, the internet also should be top on the it's list. It's a big problem. Thank you so exactly. much, uh, everyone. Uh, Timulai, thank you. Uh, thank you. Today, Especially you and especially those from Nigeria. Kudos to you. Yeah, yeah. Kudos. Kudos to them all. Thank we you appreciate you guys. So, uh, we'll be... <laughs> thank you. So, thank you, viewers. You can watch this all uh, over again. You can send it to your friends uh, for them to be able to see Mr. Shore's response to various questions. We will be live soon with uh, you know various other topics and the personalities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. A pleasure. Bye.